really focused on two people died, which is kind of like obvious, but um, that always just kind of stayed in my mind. But today I want us to look at Ananias and Sapphira from a different way. We're going to consider their motives. Um, when you hear the word motives, without looking at your notes, without looking at the screen, without Googling it, uh, what would you say comes to mind when you hear the word motive? Self-serving. Self desire. Intention of the heart. Intention of the heart. Purpose. Purpose. Purposes. Purpose. Okay, anything else? Motives. The you do something. Motives. The reason you do something. What compels you? Y'all are smart. Good job. Um, the, the actual definition, if you want to fill it in, will be in your notes here. Um, a reason for doing something, way to nail it. Um, but especially one that is hidden or not obvious. So motives are defined as a reason for doing something, especially one that is hidden or not obvious. So for example, last night my son, can I do anything for you, mom? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure, go to this. You know, he keeps coming back. Can I, is there anything else I can be doing for you, mom? Literally within minutes, his best friend's mom texts me. Can Daniel spend the night, Thursday night, and like come over and play with Colton? I was like, there's the real motive behind this like amazing servant child of mine. Um, but I took advantage of it shamelessly, so it was a win for everybody. Um, but you know, you kind of think, what does he want? What's his motive here? Why is he asking this? This must not be in his character if he's, you know, so sweet to his little sister suddenly. Uh, so today we're going to do a quick recap of the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Um, we're in Acts chapter 5, in case you missed it. And I'm just going to read the story. It's 11 verses. Bear with me. This is not King James, so you should all be able to understand it just fine. There's no bees and vowels or willis or whatever. Okay, so Ananias and Sapphira, chapter 5, verse 1. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself, with his wife's full knowledge, and bringing a portion of it, he laid at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. That means he died. And great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up, covered him up, and carried him out. They buried him. Now there lapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, Why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. Maybe he said it a little more sympathetic, I don't know. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Um, yes, that would do it to me too. Great fear. Um, so I want to look at Ananias and Sapphira's motives. I know it's going to bother people if I don't pick this up, so I'm just going to pick that up. Because they would bother me. Um, it does bother me. Okay. So I was thinking of these are just my, this is my thoughts of what I'm assuming possible motives they may have had for their giving. So your first blank um, on this section, it's going to be, to me, it seems that they, may, they wanted to appear spiritual, um, to gain man's approval, but their hearts were motivated by greed and hypocrisy. Don't know how to spell hypocrisy, just look at that screen. Don't even worry about if the neighbor looking if you're looking at how to spell it because I need to look, know how to spell things all the time. So to 
to me, it seems that they wanted to appear spiritual to gain man's approval, but their hearts were motivated by their greed and hypocrisy. I think greed because they kept part of the money back for themselves. Um, they were both fully aware of what they were doing. They had collaborated on this, and they, they decided to conceal this fact. So it was with the intention, we're going to, we want this money, we want others to think we're spiritual, and we're going to conceal the fact that we did not give it all. So it's a little plot going on here. Um, I was watching a movie the other night. Um, has anyone ever seen the movie Flywheel? It's one of the first of, like, the people that made Courageous, uh, Fireproof. Anyway, so it's like their first movie. It's called Flywheel. And um, in the movie, the main character, the offering plate's coming around, and he puts in an empty tithe envelope to appear as if he's giving. I never even considered this. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, that was crazy to me to see. He just, he looks at it, you know, puts it in the plate. It's totally empty. And his wife, after church, says, you just wanted people to think there was something in that envelope. Clearly his motives were to appear spiritual, to deceive others, um, all for the benefit of making himself look better. Obviously that's a very um, blatant example, but it got the point across um, that even on a Sunday morning we can be appearing um, spiritual and, and miss the whole point entirely of why we are to give. Um, next I say that they were motivated by hypocrisy um, because they wanted everyone to see their good works. So Ananias and Sapphira come, they want everyone to see that they're going to do a good work here by giving um, what seems to be all of their um, money from this sold property. I wanted to read what Jesus has to say about this, uh, Matthew 6, 1. It's pretty short, so you don't have to turn there if you're not. Just don't worry, I'll read it to you. Okay, Matthew 6, 1. Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So what's he saying to beware of? Beware of practicing your righteousness before men. So beware of doing your good deeds so others can see. That speaks to me. Um, my friend Joanna, she's... She'll tease me about this, because I confessed, I don't know why I told her this, <laughs> people, um, that when I go through the coffee drive through when I go through Dutch Bros, the super nice people that work there will ask, what are you doing today? Got anything fun planned? And if I am going to like Bible study, church, church event, life group, any Christian function, I feel like I need to tip them. So if they ask me, what are you doing? And I tell them, and it's actually like a Christian type thing, I'm like, oh, I gotta tip them now. <laughs> okay, I have a rotten heart. I am just confessing my sins one to another. And this is how bad it is, though. The tip doesn't count unless they see it. So, like, if they're over here mixing my drink, which is a hot black Americano, and they don't see me give my dollar, it doesn't count. And I have to wait till they're looking. <laughs> I'm so sinful, you guys. And I put my dollar in. And then every time I have this, like, moral dilemma, like, now they know I'm a Christian, now I have to give them a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> so how have I just solved my dilemma? Well, I go to Starbucks. They don't ask me what I'm doing today. And I don't have to tip anybody. It's amazing. So, I'm just kidding. That's my wicked heart trying to get out of tipping people. And I know all of you have, okay, maybe one person here has probably done that before. But really, that's just showing me I want to do, sound the trumpets, everybody. I'm giving my dollar. This is going to amaze everybody, I know. And it's just, it's ridiculous. My footnote humored me. Um, my, I have a John MacArthur study Bible. And he called hypocrites spiritual phonies. And I was like, oh, yeah. Got it. Right here. Spiritual phonies. Um, but he says, and I think I added it in your notes, a spiritual phony um, would be 
the ones who followed the traditions of men because such teaching required only mechanical and thoughtless conformity without a pure heart. So it's just that easy thing to do. Our heart change is not involved. There doesn't have to be a pure heart. It's external, completely external actions without a conformed, uh, pure heart. And, um, and that is obviously... Um, not appealing to anyone. The Lord is not a fan of the spiritual phony. Um, and it seems to me that Ananias and Sapphira didn't give out of the pureness of their hearts. That's just my, you know, reading the text, what I'm observing. Um, I do want to look back at Acts 4, 34 and 35. Um, everyone's doing it. Everyone's giving, um, giving away their stuff, apparently. Says Acts thirty Acts four through verse thirty four. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sale, and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had any had need. Verse thirty six. This I think good example of giving. We're going to read about Barnabas in one second. I think may have got to Ananias and Sapphira. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Story done, ended. Nothing was wrong. He didn't kill over. Clearly, he probably gave with a good heart, good in, good motives. Ananias and Sapphira, not so much. Um, I think. Um, Sometimes in the church, we might even envy someone else's um, attention and recognition that they get for a good deed they have done. I know at times I've served because I want to add a girl, but um, that's not the correct motive. Um, perhaps Ananias and Sapphira, I think it's on your notes here, they had self-righteous motives. Um, if I give, then God will accept me. That's based on me, a self-righteous motive would be, if I do this, I'm acceptable to God. Remember, our righteousness does not come by anything we do. It is by Jesus Christ our Savior. So we are not, we cannot self-save ourselves. I don't even know if that makes sense. Um, but only Jesus Christ can save us. So the human heart is crafty. We scheme and we manipulate. We have the audacity to think um, with these self-seeking motives. If I do this, if I give you this, God, then you got to do this for me. I think we kind of rationalize and think my good deeds plus God he's equals he's going to do what he wants for me or what I want him to do for me. Um, so all of this got me thinking about what brings us to point number two about my own heart. And I heard a question that's really been sticking with me. Um, this man, Timothy Keller, he re writes a book called Gospel in Life. And he asks this question that I can't shake from my head. Um, point number two, what motivates me to do good deeds? And why, which is your next blank, why do I do the good that I do? In worldly wisdom, we might think a good deed is a good deed no matter what the reason. No, I want to get down to what is the reason in my own life that Sheree Finney does good deeds. Why do I do the good that I do? What is my motive? Um, I gotta tell you, it isn't pretty. I have some days, some, that are led by the Spirit, where I'm giving out of love and obedience. Um, when I feel the Lord's prompting me, I respond. Okay, I have some good days. Not so much all the time. Um, I, I really, as I read about the heart and in Scripture, I really want to question my motives in my giving. Um, I realize that sometimes I give out of my neediness to be accepted. I, I love human approval. I just love the add a girl. When I was a little girl, I'd write down, if my mom went to the store, it was gone a couple hours, I would write down in detail everything I did while she was gone away at the store. So she could tell me, like, wow, good job. You're so amazing. You took the remote and you put it, put it back where it goes. Good job. <laughs> I was just seriously, like, I just obsessed with human approval. I had to have it. Um, I... I know that, you know, Colossians 3.23, it says to work heartily as for the Lord, not for man. I have struggled so much with that, that I just want to work and have the approval of man. But it's like, Lord, 
correct me when I have that thinking. I want your approval. That is all that matters. Um, I don't want to work heartily as for man. I want to do it as for the Lord. Uh, God is good, though. He's going to reveal this to you if you are seeking him and asking him. Um, he'll tell you where your, where your issues lie. Um, and I don't want to live for my own glory, that's for sure. So at the top of your notes, I had a verse, um, Acts 5-4, and it was just taken from our chapter this week. And it, it just asked the question, um, why is it that you conceived this deed in your heart? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? So it's kind of, it's burst out of the heart. The, the sin is acted out, you know, um, externally, but it was burst within the heart. So I wanted to take a look at James. Um, in James chapter 1, we can kind of get a look into the heart and the role it plays um, with our sin. So James 1, verse 14. I think I have, it. yes, cool. All right, so James 1. Verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, there's that word again, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. I, um, I, I think other translations, let's see, we have his own lust. What do other translations say in verse 14? But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by, do we have anything different? Desire. Desire. Is it evil desire? Evil desire. Evil desire. Okay, so we have um, James 1, 14 talking about evil desire in our heart or our own lust. Yuck. Uh, I don't want that in my heart. I want that out of there. Colossians 3, 5 um, is another verse I'd like to read. I'm sorry, my hands are like so cold, it's almost hard to like turn the page. All right, Colossians 3, 5. Uh, what does it say? I will tell you. So, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Dead to what? Dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Idolatry is a pretty strong word. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, we got that evil desire brought up again, greed, which amounts to idolatry. Um, I, I want to take a look at Proverbs 16. We're going to focus on um, the heart, and um, we might think we have pure motives, but we're going to find out who's actually the judge of that. So Proverbs 16, verse 2. All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Um, oh, this is one of those stories I did not want to have to tell. <laughs> Only because the person that involves is here, and they're going to totally know it's them when I spill my guts. So, um, so motives, motives. I can even self-deceive myself that I have good motives when I give. So a little while back, I bought this gift, and my friend's, uh, it was for my friend's daughter, and I'm like, got this gift for your daughter, could you get it to her for me? Sure, yeah, no problem, fine. So I, I genuinely thought when I, bought the gift. It was just for that person. I was like, oh, I, I, I'm a gift giver. I really do like giving gifts. I love giving gifts. I love getting gifts. <laughs> just kidding. No, I really don't. Okay, so, um, so I give my friend this gift to give to her daughter, and I wait. No text of thanks? Check my mailbox. No notes of thanks? <laughs> this cannot be. And so then I was like, this really irks me. Why does this irk me? Maybe because my motive for giving the gift was not pure. It was not for that person's best interest. It was for my little ego to get a job. You're so nice. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, I had impure motives. And the best thing that could happen was that person not thanking me. Why? Because it revealed what was in my heart. It revealed that I was giving it for approval, for thanks. 
um, and to boost my little ego like it needed some more boosting. Um, so I was really, really thankful that this person did not thank me. And I hope they never do, because I don't have to tell them <laughs> how sinful I am again. Um, but the Lord is good. He's going to um, call us out. He's going to weigh the motives of our heart. I know you're all scared now, but next time you give a gift, you'll be thinking about this. Okay. Um, here's a great motivator. Just kidding. Okay. Proverbs 21, 2 is our next verse we're going to look at. I just love Proverbs. I just, it's good stuff. All right. Proverbs 21, 2. Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. It might seem right in our own eyes, but Lord, would you weigh my heart? Would you show me? what the condition of my heart actually is. So this brings us to our last point number three. And this is such a weird concept until you really start to think about it. So please think about it. The statement is, and I heard this from Timothy Keller, we need to learn to repent not only for our bad deeds, but also for the reason we do our good deeds. We need to learn to repent not only for our bad deeds, but also for the reason we did our good deeds. Giving that gift was not a bad deed. The motives of my heart were not good. I, I did not have a pure heart in my giving. Um, I, I had to repent of a good deed. I, I had to repent for the motives I had for doing this good deed. Um, Another quote I read, it said, Empty ritualism does not bring closeness to God. Good deeds don't bring you closer. And, and I love how um, Jesus talks about don't honor God um, with your lips. I think he's referring to something Isaiah said. But um, the people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I want to have a heart that is close to God, not just a mouth that's honoring God him falsely with this wicked heart, but I want to have a heart aligned with him. Um, and, and I also want to bring about the point that good deeds with pure motives, they're a good thing, but they are not the ultimate thing. Okay, I'm not here to preach like, be good, do good, have the right motives. It's not just about that. It's That's a good thing, but it's not the ultimate thing. The ultimate thing is we want to have closeness with the Father Understanding that the work of Jesus Christ is the ultimate thing. He has taken care of all that I need. My good deeds, my good works won't save me. Jesus Christ is the only one that can do that. Um, I, my self-righteousness can't save me. It can't even do me any good. Uh, but Jesus Christ is the ultimate, ultimate good. He's the ultimate thing in our life. So don't confuse good things with the ultimate thing. Um, to pray us out today, we're actually going to be out up here on time, and y'all can get warm. Um, I just want to pray out Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, as a closing prayer to you all. Um, if you want to turn there, you're welcome to, but Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Um, just quick prayer. Dear God, I thank you so much for your word and I thank you for the truth you've made known um, by your Holy Spirit through the word, Lord. I pray that you would just impress upon our hearts Lord, truth, and that we may know you, that we may seek a closeness to you, Lord, that you would help us evaluate why we do our good deeds, God. Check our motives, weigh our hearts, and turn us back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.